things to go before we jump into our Bibles. Uh, first and foremost, if you've never been here before, welcome. Uh, I'd like to see if you could maybe fill out one of these things so we can get to know you a little bit. Um, on that table by the by the door before you leave, there's a table with a couple computers on it, a green tablecloth. You can grab one of these things, fill it out, drop it into one of the white offering boxes by the door. Um, and you're going to say, well, what offering boxes? Now, we've had these offering boxes for about three years. And I still get questions as to where do we put our offerings. So I want to I want to show you. you. See that up on the screen? That's the white offering box. Okay, so there's two of them, one on either side of the door. And you can put your, your offering in there. And then also I think there's another picture in there. That's the that's our online giving. So if you want to use your card, you can do that. Most of us have zero money with us uh, or a check. Uh, I can vouch for that. I actually have zero money. Uh, it's a whole different story. Another sermon for another day. But. Um, you can give on that, and so I know that nobody has the cash. So you can use your debit card, and it's really, really easy. I know this is kind of stupid. We're supposed to be talking about spiritual things. So let me just walk you through this whole money thing uh, with the giving, because everyone asks me how to use it, so it's just quite, quite simple. Let me just explain. In case you want to use online giving, this is a quick uh, giving one-on-one. -on -one. The first thing you do is click in the amount you want to give, and then there's a little yellow thing there. You you point at it and click on it for swiping card, then you swipe the card and click submit and done. That's it. Who can do that? I can. I can even do that. So that was the litmus test. If I could do it, we could do it. All right. Um, enough of that. That was about the front door. Um, I know a lot of you um, signed up for this November 24th at Sunset Island Park, this community Thanksgiving dinner that the JC Road Dogs are hosting. And a lot of you, and that's awesome, fill out that they're gonna, you're going to make some food and, and help those that are in need, which I commend you for. I think that's wonderful. But now it's getting close, so I just wanted to remind you that this event is coming up. And so if you've made a commitment, so let's make sure since we're Christians that we're going to keep our commitments. Amen? Okay? So uh, if you don't remember what you committed to, I'm just going to take this thing right here, and I'm going to put it on this countertop, and you can check it out before you leave. And then also, if you need to, there's some um, aluminum foil, there's some like foil uh, pans, tins, whatever that you can cook with. They've been provided to you. And so in the kitchen, uh, I think they're on the stove. You can just grab whatever you need uh, and take it home and put your potatoes or turkey or whatever it is that you're committed to. Please go ahead and grab those things and, uh, and you can take them home and use them. And if you want to come out that day and actually help them, I'm sure they would welcome that. I don't know a lot of the details of it. Actually, Mary's kind of uh, spearheading that effort for this church. Um, but I think Mary is sick tonight, and I think Justin was, like, puking. Let's just say it. He was puking, and so they're not here. So I don't have a lot of the um, answers for you. But anyway, okay, here's another thing that's going on. Alicia has been walk walking around asking about your birthday, right? So this is what, what I want to do is I want to um, let you know, if you don't know, that Alicia will come and harass you. But it's for a good cause. She wants, we want to uh, celebrate you. We want to celebrate that you're here. We want to celebrate you're part of the family. We want to celebrate that God put you into our life. And so if you would, uh, just see her. And she's going to mark down in our calendar when your birthday is so we can somehow honor you and bless you. Okay, so if you would see Alicia and put your name down there for her, that would be awesome. Some more announcements here before we, before we jump into our Bible. Um, as many of you know, we're going to be doing a wedding celebration for... Pat and Jamie here tomorrow afternoon at 4.30. So, yeah. um, it's going to be the real deal. Like, they're going to walk the aisle, and, and I, I think I'm going to tie and stuff. So come, you know what I mean? So, um, but, so come for that, and then if you would, uh, you could bless them. If you want to bring them a gift, you can, but that's not the gift, really. That we, what we really want is we want to eat. Okay, so if you will, uh, it's, we're going to have a potluck dinner right after it. So if you would come and bring something to share with the family and we can stay and we can celebrate their marriage, that would be awesome. Um, also, um, for those that normally would come to our Sunday night round table, we're not going to have that because we're going to be doing this with Kyle and Jim. So I would appreciate if you all come and let's have a good time. Now, uh, on Tuesday night, some of the men in the church meet. And then on Wednesday night, some of the ladies in the church meet, and they just get together in life groups. You know, they just encourage one another, they pray, go through books, uh, reference the Bible, pray for each other, see what's going on, I can help you, help you help me. They're good times, everybody enjoys them. Um, the ladies are, they're going to suspend the Wednesday nights until after Thanksgiving. It just it gets so busy with the holidays, 
and you know you show up and there's one two one or two people and it, it just gets a little chaotic. So um, they're going to suspend their meetings until after Thanksgiving. So it'll be December fourth that they'll pick it back up again. And uh, they have finished the purpose-driven life. They'll pick up a new study. I don't know exactly. Uh, Mary's kind of working on that. I don't know exactly what's going to happen with that, but. Uh, please put that in your calendar. If you're a lady here in this church um, and you want to grow in your relationship with the Lord and with um, your fellow members of the body of Christ, this is a great opportunity to do it. Okay, so I would encourage you to come. Now, um, the guys, we're not slackers. Okay, so we're going to keep meeting. Uh, all right? We're going to keep meeting. And I don't care if there's two people here, we're going to do it anyway. Um, just, just messing with me. We're going to do it anyway. So come out Tuesday night at 630. We'll... I don't know, I think Mark's got something that he wants to share with us. This, this past week, he, he brought a video where they, uh, they, I guess they, you know, the, 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 the assumption is when they saw the, the panoramic, the, the bird's eye view of this area, they were like, hey, that's where Sodom and Gomorrah was. They found all these little chunks of sulfur in the rock where there was like hellfire and brimstone coming. It's kind of neat. So we shared that and we finished the last chapter of Herb's Driven Life. But it was a good time. He was excited about watching. He wanted to share with his brothers. And so he did. It was a good time down by all. And we'll continue to, to do some things for the next couple of weeks, kind of here and there, and then we'll set on something more solid. Um, the ladies not meeting um, next week, however, uh, most of the teachers that teach the kids, uh, most of you do come to the Wednesday night. Event. So although they're suspending the, the Wednesday night meeting with the ladies uh, until December 4th, this coming Wednesday, Meredith has asked me to ask anyone who teaches, and anyone who would be so kind as to volunteer and teach, amen, amen. would come on Wednesday night, this Wednesday night, because we have, if many of you may know, we have we've gone, we've used two different curriculums, and they're both very good over the last couple of months. And so what we want to do is we want to get all the teachers together and get your input on as to which one you thought was most beneficial for these children to know Christ. Okay, so whatever the best curriculum is that you feel is better. We did uh, this thing with Buck Denver and the little puppet things, and then there was this thing here with the pirates and all these different things. But the two different curriculums want your input. So please, can't make it mandatory because we're not paying you enough, right? But um, if we could, it would be mandatory. But please come because we value your input and we want to know what's best for our children. So please come this Wednesday night at 6.30. Um, I want to let you know also there's... Um, I don't know, probably about a year ago, I let you all know about a, a, an app for your Android phone where you can actually get uh, an app for this church where there's a prayer cloud and all the um, all of our message videos are easily accessible. I guess that's the whole idea of an app, which just makes it easier to get to something. Um, so we launched that thing uh, on the Android market, but we, you, you all know that kind of app is kind of really, you know, Excelling, they're selling off phones, and everyone seems to have an iPhone. So, just want to let you know that it is incomplete because the, it has not been filled completely yet, and the graphics aren't really all there yet. But there is now that same app, although it's much sexier and prettier on the iPhone. Amen. Yeah. Uh, it's available on the iPhone now too, so you can go to the iPhone market and you can, or whatever they call it, iTunes or something. Yeah. I don't know. App Store. Um, I don't know. So it's all there. So you can go there and you can download it. It's free. And you can, um, you can post prayer requests on there. Um, you can uh, show somebody uh, one of the messages that you get here at the church. Maybe they want to learn something about the church before they come. So you can, um, you can, sh you can share that with them right on your phone. Okay? Yeah, just, just look up SNL Church and you'll see it right there. Um, I guess that's about it. I don't really have any other announcements unless I'm missing something. Anybody have anything that they need to share? I don't know. I don't know. Come on. What's your friend's name? Where's her friend's name? What's your friend's name? What's your friend's name? Cancer? Is that what it is? Okay. Let's take a few moments before we jump into the Bible. Uh, Pat's asked us to pray for somebody. Um, and so let's do that, and then we'll ask God to bless our time here together as we, as we venture into his word. Um, God, you're, you're so good. You're so good. Um, Stand back there in the corner and listening to your music. And you're so good. These songs are intended to, to rise up to you and, and bring you honor and glory and tell of your wonderful godness. And, and they do, but just sitting back there and, and 
you're so good to your people. Just to sit and listen to beautiful music. To be able to come and spend time with people that we love, people that love us, even though we don't deserve it. To be able to come to a beautiful place like this, such a rich heritage of faithfulness, people way back when, in the 1800s, building this place to spread your good news to this community. This has been a while, Lord, since anything really has been going on here, but in the resurrection business, and it's very evident right here, you breathe new life into this old structure. Sister Pat, who we love, and we know anyone who knows her knows that she is a prayer warrior. She just prays and prays and prays all day for everybody. I thank you for her friendship. I thank you that she prays for me. I know that helps keep me going. We can learn a lot from her. Her prayer regimen to be well, she was just dedicated to speaking to you. Help us to be more like that. And she has a friend, Vincent. I don't know Vincent. I know the restaurant that he owns and runs. He's blessed many of us with good food over the years. We thank you for that. But now we ask that you would bless him and help him in his time of need. Sin has entered the world, and because of it, we experience pain and sickness, and strife and trouble and calamity and every other ugly word. Lord, we know that you do not go against who you are. We don't change your character. You are God. So I don't even know personally how this all works. But it is the will of us that gather here tonight, your children, that you would bring healing and peace and comfort to Vincent. That you help him in this great time of need. There are times in our life where we realize that there is nothing else that we can do except to fall at your feet and ask for your mercy. likes to really be there at that spot. I venture to say that that is a great spot to be in. And tonight, Lord, you're going to share with us in your word just how precious it is to be in that place. Completely being vulnerable. Unable to fix a problem on our own. Absolutely in need of your spirit. Absolutely in need of your prepared to deliver this message. <coughs> so I need you to help me. These people are precious to you, much more precious to you than they are to me, although I love them. You want their very best. So I pray that you would speak to them tonight. Even if they hear my words, it's not what they're supposed to hear. It's twofold. 
There's two reasons. One, and that is to, to bring glory to God. Like, that's the most important thing. So we can tell him how great he is, and we can read his stories of the things that he's done, and realize how awesome he is, and we can praise him and tell him he's great, and he can show off, and everybody would love him, and ultimately we'd like to see all these seats filled with repentant sinners, and they've all given their life to Christ, and they're raising their hands, and they're worshiping him. More people, you know, the king's glory is a growing population. That's what, that's what we want. That's why we're here. That's why we gather. So we can brag on him. He's a big, 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 big show off. And that's cool. That's the number one thing. The second thing is kind of a byproduct. That is uh, his glory, our blessing. But, you know, as we read the stories and we see what he's done and we praise him, but it, it builds our faith. It builds our trust in him. We can lean on him a little bit more solidly because we see what he's done and we get, um, we get lifted up and we can trust him a little bit more. So that's why we gather. Bring him glory, bring us blessing. They kind of go hand in hand. And I don't want tonight to be any exception. And so that's why that's been my prayer these last couple days, that those two things would be accomplished here tonight in our gathering. Now, we started this series of absolute authority for, for two reasons. One, just kind of just a quick rewind, okay, just a quick rewind. And that is, if, if you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, but, but sometimes you're kind of in a little bit of a valley, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know you're going to go to heaven, but you really feel like hell. Anyone ever been there, right? And so sometimes we need a bump, right? We need to, and what better thing to do than go back into the scriptures and see what Jesus has accomplished to give us that little bump, you know, a little confidence in him, right? So we can say, yeah, we, we, we did, we had a bad day, but we made a really good decision to accept him as Lord and Savior. He's got this. And then also for those that are not believers, maybe you don't even, maybe you don't believe in God. Maybe you, don't, you haven't done the whole Jesus thing. Maybe you, you're kind of searching and looking for the right answer. Like, who's going to be my Lord and Savior? You kind of spin the wheel. You know, and so what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you some information so that you could just make a decision as to who you were. Like, you hear, if you go through this whole series and you go, yeah, but that's fine. That's your deal. Enjoy hell. You know what I'm saying? It's not good. It's not good. And I don't want you to go with it, but that's your decision. All right? So i got to give you some information, okay? So here's the thing. In, in Matthew 28, remember he said this. He says something that's really offensive. Jesus says something that's offensive to a lot of people. And he says this. It's in the Great Commission. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So is that is that arrogance? Like, I'm the top dog of all things in all of the universe? Is that arrogance or is that authority? So we, what, this is what he said. He says that. He also says, I am the way, the truth, and life. And no one gets the Father except for me. So you should believe in me. And so therefore, because I'm the boss of all things, I'm in charge of all things, you should just go tell everyone that following me is the right way. And they should all, everyone, every people group across the earth should follow me because I am the right way. All these other ones, false gods. No, man. That's authority, right? That, that's really taking the high road. That's a big, big statement. So he's like, God, be God. And I know some, some of you might not even realize that yet. You haven't made that decision. But being God, he knows that not everybody's going to believe it just because he says it. Right? I can say it. Is this being going to believe me? So what does he do? He says, listen, I'm going to go and I'm going to authenticate what I said. I make a claim that I'm God, uh, so believe in me, but, but at least believe me because of the works I'm going to do. So he goes around Israel authenticating with these incredible, incredible, incredible goal, incredible goal, <laughs> incredible miracles that only God could do so that you would believe. He's like, okay, you want to see what I'm going to do? Watch me work. Okay, so he goes through and he does all these things. Like the, the first couple weeks, we talked about these amazing miracles that he performed. He went to this leper who was like a social outcast, who's a religious outcast. And really, back in those days, social and religion, they were almost one. Now, not so much. Not so much. Okay, not that we should legislate morality, because that's stupid, but we should have a little bit more of Christianity in everything that we do. Okay, amen. But here's the thing. Okay, back then, a religious and social outcast, the leper, he's not accepted by anybody. Okay, he's hated by everybody. He's filthy, dirty. No one interacts with him. The leaders won't talk to him. No one wants to go there. Remember what Chris Mansfield is going through? The, he's, he, he did the example for us. He's, he, he was the leper for us, right? Keep praying for his little boy. I think they're home today, but going back to the hospital. 
Um, but he, they used to go through town with their mouth covered so like they couldn't breathe on people because they thought that's how it was passed on. Remember how when AIDS first came out, don't sit on that toilet and you'll get AIDS, right? That's the way it was back then with leprosy. They had no idea what was going on, so they would have to go through town going, I'm clean, I'm clean, I'm clean, so that you wouldn't go near them and they had to live as a social and religious outcast outside the camp. They weren't allowed to be there. So what does Jesus do? It's an awesome miracle. He goes and he engages with this guy and he touches this guy. He, he, he puts it all out there, right? He puts it all out there. Nobody would, everyone shun this guy for touching him. And Jesus, because he's moved by compassion, remember that? That's the most important thing. So he reaches out, he touches the guy, not just talking, and he heals him. It was an amazing miracle. Then we, we heard about the centurion's kid or the, the young slave he's got. I don't know exactly what it was, different... Uh, different uh, gospels say different things there when it comes to that young man. But he was really, really sick, and he was paralyzed, and he was in extreme pain, and he was near death, and Jesus heals the dude. He kind of like threw his voice. I don't, I don't know how he did that, right? But he's across town, he throws his voice. Hey, heal! And it just carries, and, 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 and the guy's healed from afar, right? From afar. It was an awesome miracle. The guy and he was almost dead. So the severity of the, of, the, of the problem didn't stop Jesus either. So nothing stops this guy. Nothing stops this guy. We learned last week that he goes to Peter's house and he sees Peter's mother-in-law and she's got a high temperature and she just goes over and he just goes over and he touches her hand and the, the fever's gone. And that was nice because it just speaks of how Jesus is involved, not just in you know, major healings because he's got like... He's paralyzed, and he's going to die, and I'm going to save him. A white, a, you know, a, 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 the shy, the, what is it? The night of shining, uh, I can't even speak tonight. I don't know what's wrong with me. But he comes to town, he rescues the leper and the centurion's kid, you know, all these big things. But in this case, he's just, he's like, not just going to heal the big stuff. I'm not just going to open the Red Sea, but I'm just going to take the bigger temperature. I got that too. And then it goes on in the story that he, he says that he, he cast out all these demons, with a simple command. He said, yeah, I got this. Done. Stop. And then, he, then they brought all the sick people. I don't even know. It doesn't even say in the scripture how many people there were. It doesn't say you know, how many illnesses there were, different variety. But he, he, he healed all of it. And so we see all these amazing miracles all the time. Okay, And it was incredible. But those miracles, like, who's ever played JV ball? Who's played JV ball, right? It was, what's JV? JV is like, like you're good, right? You're good. Not necessarily. Uh, but you're not really that good. You're like, you made the team. Like, you're better than the average everyday Joe, but you're really not that good. You know what I'm saying? And, and these miracles that, that, I just, that I just talked about, I don't want to, I'm, I'm not ripping on Jesus, you know, because he does stuff I can't do. But this is like, this is like junior varsity compared to mine. So I said the Super Bowl. So tonight's the time when, when, when Jesus goes from like, like JV to, to the Olympics. You know what I'm saying? And this miracle is just absolutely awesome, okay? Absolutely awesome. So let me set the stage here so that God, I want God, this is, this is my desire, and I hope it's yours too, I want God to receive big props tonight. Like huge, right? Because he deserves it. So he's going to show off, and you're going to see him show off tonight. But at the same time, this is what God wants to build your trust in him. Like, that is what he gathered you here tonight for. So he would receive glory and that you would trust him more. And you would love and depend on him greater. Okay, so I want to set the stage for this thing. And let me go ahead. I'm going to read this account. Now, this account of Jesus calming the storm, it, it appears in three of the Gospels. These are the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic, kind of like cinnamon. They're very similar. It's, it's Matthew, Mark. And Luke, okay, it's not in the Gospel of John, but it's in these three accounts. I, I just want to read the Mark account tonight. And this account is found in Mark chapter 4, and it's verse 35 is where it starts. I'm going to read this to you twice tonight. It's not long, but I'm going to read it to you twice. Because, two, like I said, two things I hope to accomplish with you tonight, and that is, one, that you build your faith and trust in Him. Okay, that's one. So I'm going to read it. I'm going to talk about that. And then we're going to read it again. And we're going to talk about him receiving glory. Okay? So we're going to start out with the byproducts first. That is our blessing. Are you guys all there? Okay, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. There's tons of Bibles around here. They might not be the same. But bear with me. I'm going to read it. Okay? All right, here we go. Uh, 
Um, verse 35. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. What I'd ask you to do is, as I read this, I want you to try your very best to actually create the scene in your imagination. Okay? Go there. Go there. Be there with them on the water. Soon a fierce storm comes up. High waves are breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Totally chill. That's not it. The disciples woke him up, shouting, I'm going to shout now, Teacher, don't you care we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the water, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Some translations will say amazed. The disciples were absolutely terrified and amazed. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obeyed. Okay. Here's the story. Let's set the stage. Let's give you a visual. Um, if you have a Bible that has maps, if you, have, if you have a Bible that has a map at the back of it, anyone? If you do, go to the back, okay, and it's, I think it's the very last of the maps. I want to do this for you. I should probably put it up on the screen. I apologize for this. Um, but we'll do it the old-fashioned way. Um, if you look on your map, you're going to see that up here at the, the top, in northern Israel, is this little, what they call the Sea of Galilee. Um, Lots of famous stuff in the scriptures happens around this little lake. Lots of stuff. And you'll find out about that as you read. As a matter of fact, if you have that map, you'll see that there's a whole list where Jesus is involved with some things, and a lot of it takes place. And you'll notice it's just pockmarked with stuff right around this little, um, what we would call the Sea of Galilee. I would venture to say that uh, for us, we would probably call it a lake. Uh, it's not that big. It's actually 13 miles from north to south, and it's 7 miles east and west. So it's really not that large by any means. To them, it was large because they're not like us. We could just, you know, drop an outboard motor on that thing, and we'd be across that 7 miles in 7 minutes. No big deal, right? Well, back then, if, you, if you've done any research at all, you see that the boats that they had were kind of like uh, large canoes, really. They're, they're not really fancy. And so you would be rowing, and you might have a primitive mass with a sail on it, okay? But you got to remember something, a little research about the, the, the Sea of Galilee. Um, they didn't have the mast up when this was happening, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. Um, if you live in Florida, you know that in the summertime, we have a, a kind of a, a normal weather pattern, right? Now, over the last couple of years, it really hasn't been clicking, you know? But this year, we saw it. It gets real hot. And then about 2, 3, 4 o'clock, the clouds are building up, and finally they can't take it anymore, and they start crying. And so it starts raining, right? That's what happens. It's just a normal pattern. It doesn't happen every day, but pretty regularly that's what happens, okay? So if you don't study the Sea of Galilee, you'll, you'll find that on this lake, it's, first of all, it's, so if you look at your map, you're going to see there's a lot of little squiggly lines all around. That means there's mountains all around it. So there's a lot of mountains all around it. And so storms would brew up on those mountaintops. And then in, in the Gospel of Luke, in this account, it says that the storm dropped. And those things happen at night, generally speaking, on the Sea of Galilee. These things happen at night. That's their weather pattern. The storms, they build up, and then at night, they come down over the mountains. And you don't see them coming. So it's a little bit scary. But, they, but these guys, remember something. These guys, most of them were fishermen on that lake. They've been spending their whole professional life fishing on, so they knew that, like, they knew the weather pattern, right? They knew that something could come in. So there's not going to be a sail, so they're actually row, they're going to row, Jesus said, let's go across the lake. So they're going to row at the very minimum seven miles with maybe a storm on the way, don't know for sure, but that's what happens in the evenings. So they're going to go across the lake. And they're going to row there. They're going to row there. Now, 
we do know that it does happen in the evening, because two of the Gospels do say that. That as evening came, this is what happened. Now, this, I, I want to I set the stage for awesomeness for God, okay? Because, you've got to stop and you've got you to take this into account. They have been doing, they've been doing this, they've been ministering all day. All day, okay? So, these dudes are tired. Jesus is tired, okay? Now, he's God, I can understand. He can do lots of awesome stuff. Thank you, Kyle. He can do all, all kinds of awesome stuff, but he's 100% God, he's 100% man. So he can get tired, okay? He can get tired. And so if you read these accounts in, in Matthew and in Mark, you're going to see that they, they've been ministering all day. There's the Sermon on the Mount, like they've been preaching, 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 preaching. Jesus has been preaching and preaching and preaching all day. And then we see the leper healing. Then we see the centurion's son healed. And then we see the, the Peter mother, and her mother, his mother-in-law, she's healed. And then all these demons, they're cast out of all these people. And then all the sick people came and healed every single one. So there's a lot of big words in these sections of scripture. They were hard at this thing all day. Now listen, when I get done here tonight, I'm going to be whipped just because of this. Jesus' ministry is, I'm pathetically nothing compared to this guy. Like, he was, he was, he was healing all the sick people, right? Let's not forget something. But I drove, and y'all can make fun of my car, but it got me here, right? I drove here. Okay, remember something. When Jesus goes town to town with his disciples, guess what they're doing? They're walking. Okay, now I'm not saying they didn't eat, but there's no mention of food here. So they could have, they might have, they might not have, I don't know. But, but he's been walking from town to town. He's been teaching all day. So that they, they were there. And he was teaching with great authority. So he's preaching and preaching and preaching for hours. And he's healing all these people. And he's walking from town to town. And then he's on the lake. And they're rowing seven miles. A very minimum seven miles across this lake. Just, they're tired. Set up more awesomeness now. Okay? It's also dark. It's evening. Now, like when I went out of the boat with, with Jared, we were out there, I don't know, two, three miles? Like we're in just a, a, you know, the other coastal kind of, but you know, you can see like there's houses and stuff and hotels or whatever. You can see it because there's electricity. Okay, they didn't have electricity back then. So if you go out in the middle of this lake at nighttime and it's 13 by 7 miles, you know, pretty big when you're sitting out there in the middle of it, but you don't see anything. If you're lucky, you, you, you know, you might see some stars before the storm comes. You might see the moon. Uh, you, you, you might see maybe, if you're, if you're lucky, you might see maybe a little uh, campfire or something over here. And maybe a little fire over there. Maybe flickering on the shore because somebody's, you know, burning the midnight oil, if you will. But you can't see, so it's kind of scary, right? Kind of scary. You don't really know where you're going. And again, minimum. Of thir uh, seven miles. And Jesus asked this of these people. And when I go through all that stuff and I realize that they have to row, they've been working hard all day, they're exhausted, they're going to row seven miles, it's pitch black, they can't see anything, and all of a sudden this massive storm, these are trained fishermen, and what does he say? We are going to die! Right? Speaking in absolutes, like we're going to die. I just I just side note, tell God your absolutes, and, and he needs a good laugh, okay? And he makes this known right here. But when I read this stuff, and I ponder all the conditions that are here on this lake, that everything they're going through, the one word that just popped up into my mind, and I don't know if it's going to pop up into yours, and that's vulnerable. That's the word. That was the word that came to me. Vulnerable. Very susceptible to me. They're just wide open. They're, they're helpless. They can't do a single thing, right? They're out there in the middle of the lake with a, just a treacherous storm. And, and they have no one to, they've got to the end of their abilities to help themselves. And they're freaking out, and they tell Jesus, we're going to die, don't you even care? Most people would say that being vulnerable is not good. Would you agree? I'm not asking what you think, I'm saying most people would say that being vulnerable is not good. Yeah, but I think otherwise. I think that acknowledging your lack of ability only heightens the appreciation of God's ability when he invades your space. And he does something 
miraculous that you couldn't do. And, and look, I, I, I don't know what it is. I'm wretched and rotten and I've done so bad. But he's given me this, he's given me this blessing to be able to, the, 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 the veil opens once in a while and he does something amazing and I get to see it. Cheryl, right? Come on. Can I take a second? I didn't plan this, okay? Her car, it, Fred Flintstone wouldn't drive it, okay? He could go faster with his feet than her car. And she was broke, and someone called her, if I'm not correct, but someone called her and said that God just put it in their heart to, we want to just give you this minivan, right? And then someone else says, you know what, God put it in my heart to give you a plane ticket to come get your free van. You remember I told you last week how these guys are super talented and I hate them? <laughs> it's got leather. It's got a DVD player in it. Power seats, power doors, stow-and-go seating. What happened, dude? Thunder you know, he, she couldn't have, right? And so when God invades your space like that, it's like, wow, it's, it's actually good. When you're in a place of absolute, like, desperation, like you can't do anything, that's when he shines. And he wants to do that stuff so we can go, you're awesome! See, uh, last week I shared with you guys, here's another one, I shared with you guys that uh, when we were over in the other building, I told you about our giving and how it has to be a certain amount for us to float. And you're all like, oh, we got it, we got it, we got it. No, you don't, no, you don't, no, you don't. <laughs> and so it was horrible. It's like, Horrible. You're all like, yeah, I'm like, it's just 11 bucks. Just 11 bucks a month, you can do it, right? And everyone's like, yeah, we got this. So we don't have to talk about it anymore, right? Right, right, yeah. Obviously we do, because our, our giving was like two to $300 a week less here in the more expensive building than it was in the cheap joint. So I'm like, huh. So like, I don't want to, you know, we're supposed to not worry about anything, right? That's what we're supposed to do, but I'm a, I'm a wretched dude, and I, I worry. I'm Jewish, too, so it's like, in my blood, I can't help it, right? So I'm worried about, like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So I'm sitting in my house the other day, and all of a sudden my phone rings. And, and I'm not going to tell you who it is, but and some of you know who it is, but we don't have to talk about who it is, because they wouldn't want any glory in this, because for God, okay? He bought, you know that old busted up trailer that was behind our church? We used to use sometimes for the kids, the little fifth wheel, right? Okay, it was a nice donation, but it was not nice. We, all, we were all in there. It was so an old camper, right? Okay, so this dude buys it. He buys it for a couple hundred bucks. He's going to take it up and bring it into the woods in Georgia as like a little camping lodge, right? Total redneck. I mean, like Duck Dynasty, stick it up in a tree, right? So he, this is what he's going to do, right? So that's cool. So he buys it. He buys it from the church, a couple hundred bucks. He buys it, right? So, well, that's good. A couple hundred bucks, right? So he takes it home. So I'm, getting, I'm sitting in my house the other day, and I'm like, I'm in this thing, like, I don't know. Do this, I don't know how we're gonna do this, God. How we're gonna do this, God? We don't have enough money. We're gonna, we're gonna close. We're gonna close. I mean, just because I can tell you what this says, it doesn't mean I'm like graduated. So don't do as I do. Do as I say, right? Okay. So here's the thing. So I'm worried. The phone call comes and he's like, "Where are you at?" Uh, I'm at home. Can I come see you? Sure. Okay. So he tries to get to me, but he doesn't really. Doesn't make a difference. You can't get to my house. He's in this big tractor trailer. So you can't get into my neighborhood. He's afraid of not getting out. So. I get the phone call again. Hey, we are, we are. Come see me. I'm down by the end of the Dead River Road where the high tension wires are, like the power progressive progress energy or something's right there with their, you know, whatever. So I, I drive down. He's like, yeah, come down there. That's where I'm parked. So I drive down there, and there he is with the big truck. He walks up to me. He goes, um, you know that camper that, that I bought? Him? Yeah. He goes, well, God told me that I should sell it to help the church. Okay. So I'm like, you know, we've been two, three hundred dollars shy. Two to three hundred. Two fifty dollars? What's two fifty times three? How much? And he handed me seven hundred dollars. Here. As I know you need to put in the offering button. He handed me seven hundred dollars. Like, where do you where did God? Where did he come up with this stuff? Like we could sit here and try to figure out fundraising, right? We could probably do good. Some like where does that come from? Why? 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 Why is he sitting at home and all of a sudden he's like uh, you need to sell that trailer, and he sells it for the exact right amount of money to bring us right back to where we need to be. Just, why? 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 It, being vulnerable is actually good. It's good when I love it. That he's he, they're freaking out and he's sleeping, right? They're like, we're gonna die. He's, not only is it, I love this 
scriptures too because he's like, no, are we going to die? We're going to die. But he's like, he's sleeping with his head on a cushion. So he's like, it's not just like I'm okay, but he's like this. You know what I mean? I love that. I love that. It speaks of his ability. Okay. And so like when the Bible tells us in two different places in James and the first Peter. So James and Peter both tell us to humble ourselves before God. Like humble yourself before God. Um, it's a good thing to do. I don't, I, don't, I don't know how else to say it other than just, you know, admitting that you're like vulnerable, that you can't do anything. Like, I'm not, I, you're, you're everything. I can't do that. I can't, I couldn't come up with this. He keeps coming up with these things. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you got it. You saw it. You lived it. You saw it, right? I got to do that this week with this dude in the trailer. And, like, where is he? It's like, it's never the same way, too. It's like, there's always this crazy out of left field, you know, pulls it straight out of heaven off of a cloud. Boom! There it is. It's like, wow, like, how do you do that? And so when it says to humble ourselves before God, and most people are like, nah, I don't want to be, you know, humility is not really something that people like. Like, we want to be strong and in charge, and it's a miracle, and it's a miracle. But it says we should, be, we should humble ourselves under the mighty power of God. And so it goes on to say, um, the next verse, it says, give all your worries and cares to him, for he cares about you. It's good to finally just go, you know, I don't got this, you know. I still got it. And I'm getting there. And I'm getting there. And it's, it's actually it's good. It's actually, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, to, to, to realize that you don't have any real strength is liberating. It's actually liberating. It's kind of, it's a pressure off of trying to perform and trying to make it. And it's just healthy. Vulnerable, being vulnerable is, is actually a good thing. I think one of the greatest stories in all of scripture about being vulnerable and being just unable, it's, it's given by this guy who's so amazing. I mean, he performed miracles and he was just this amazing man of God. Probably like other than Jesus, the Apostle Paul is like the man. You know what I'm saying? But even the man admits he's got nothing. Do me a favor, you can keep your finger there in Mark, but go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'll just share with you, just a, it's just encouraging. I don't know I have any, any other way to say it. It's just, it's just good. This is the story. And, and, and theologians argue about this story, because that's what we Christians do. We fight about stupid stuff, but it really doesn't matter. But something is going on in Paul's life. He's got some type of ailment. And I don't, I wasn't there, okay? So maybe it literally is like a thorn that's so deep you can't get out. Maybe it's some other health thing. I don't know. I, I wasn't there. Whatever. We can have, we can talk about it. I don't know what it is, but I do know this. He asked God three times. So three times is like once is good, twice is a lot, three times it's almost like begging. You know, he's like, he's begging. He's like, please. I've got something going on. I just, it's killing me, right? It's killing me. So please take it away. So let's read here in, in verse 8 of chapter 12. Look what Paul says. So speaking of being vulnerable, just being weak, just saying, I, I got nothing I can do to help this, but you can. He says, three different times, oh, look, I begged the Lord. Can you see it? Remember I said, put yourself out of the boat? Just, 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 just picture Paul, the guy who's speaking God's words in this book, right? Speaking of, and he's, he's like, just picture he's on his knees, begging, God, please, I beg you, I beg you to take this whatever away. Take it away. And each time the Lord says, my grace is all you need. And this is it. My power works best in weakness. Now that is not what is taught in America. That weakness is good. But Jesus says, if you want me to shine, if you want to see me do some crazy stuff, you got to come. You have to lower yourself to the point where you realize you can't fix this and you need me. That's when I'm going to show off. Now he says, that my power works best in weakness. Let's just read on to the end of this paragraph. It's all good. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses. Now, again, let's talk about the way we're brought up in, in this country, in, in this world. Are we brought up to, to boast about how incapable I am of doing anything? I am the worst mechanic in the world. I can't paint. 
I don't know my multiplication tables. I don't know how to dress because I don't know my left and my right. I have no control of the English language. I am stupid. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, is this, let me ask you a question. If I went on TV and said, buy my CD, would you? I'm not, that's not Anthony Robbins talking right there, yo. You know what I'm saying? That's the guy who's bald and fat and is stupid. Buy my CD and be like me. I can't do anything. I'm nothing apart from the grace of God. Right? So that's not, that's not popular. But, but, but Paul, speaking under the inspiration of God, his spirit, says that I will boast about my weaknesses. Why? So that the power of Christ can work through me. See, when you admit, when you humble yourself before God and say, like, I'm nothing, everyone else, when they see something in your life happen, when all of a sudden the band shows up, who gets the glory, Cheryl? She can't. She's weak. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm picking on you. She's weak. She can't afford the band. She can't afford the gas to go get the band. And so when she can't do anything, like if she went, if she was loaded and went to the store and bought a brand new Honda Odyssey, y'all might say, hey, that's, and she might show it off a little bit. Hey, it's nice, it's nice, it's nice. And we'd all be happy for you, right? But when you're completely broke and you have absolutely no way to get a band and one shows up on your step, glory to God. That's, that, that's awesome, right? That's more awesome than anybody. There's tons of loaded people with good credit that can go buy a van. But not everybody has one show up for free with leather and a DVD player. <laughs> <laughs> right? So we, let's just be honest. Get back on the word. Get back on the word. Pray for me. My, hey, listen, my dog has vinyl heated seats. <laughs> That don't work, but it sounds good. And I take pleasure, look, look at it. I take pleasure in my weakness. This guy's nuts. I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. Who talks like this? That was a question, really. And the answer should be, Everyone in this room should say, me. That's, no, not me. I don't even know how to word it to make it right. But it's you and me, all of us together. We are family, okay. And, <laughs> look, here he says it again. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Okay, so I don't think we need to rehash this, but when, when we're vulnerable, when we finally say, look, I've come to the end of myself. I got nothing here. That's when Jesus says, yeah, I got this. And you give him this, this silver platter, this stage to show off and show how strong he is. And I've, I've said this before, we get everything so set up in our life that we have no real reason for God to shine. Then we, he's not, he doesn't do anything. He's just like, like there's some common grace. He'll bring the sun out for you. He'll bring the moon out. He'll, he'll have water for you. You know, you'll be able to breathe and you'll be able to see. There's some common grace and all that. But this specific grace, this thing where he shines in your life and does something awesome, it, you know, he shows up to do those things when you need him. So need him. So need him. There, there's, there's something else here that, that these... Let me just say this. Our ability to fix stuff, um, it's no different than, than the disciples' ability to fix stuff. There's nothing new under the sun. You know, if anything, like maybe our technology is a little better now. Like we have fancy computers and video cameras and we got apps on our phone. And all. I mean, we got that, right? But people's ability to fix their problems really hasn't changed. And, and so they have no ability to fix their problem. They're out there in the middle of the lake. It's dark, they're tired, scared, the waves are crashing in, flooding this little, you know, large-scale canoe, and they're freaking out, right? And so they have no ability to fix it, but our ability is no different. But we do have one thing. We have one distinct advantage that they didn't have. And, and it's found in the scriptures, and I want to share it with you. Do me a favor, go to Philippians chapter 4. I, I kind of mentioned it earlier when I was talking about my little warming problem. But if you go to Philippians chapter 4, we have something that 
actually was spoken of tonight in our music quite a bit. It's a blessing. It's a gift. Go to Philippians chapter 4. Look at verse uh, 6 and 7. Spirit didn't live inside of them yet. 
They were still relying on physical things, seeing it. You don't have to see it. That, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. And that's all you need to do is talk to him. And he will bring you peace so that it, you avoid the freak outs. That's your blessing. Remember I said that two things happen when we gather. One is we, we, give, we shoot glory where it's deserved. And we brag on him, we show off, he gets to show off. We tell him how awesome he is, we read him what he's done, and we give him credit and glory for it all. Yay! But then we get a byproduct, we get blessed. Now that's your blessing. The gift is that if you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, Ephesians 1.13 says that the moment you believe, when you believe, he put his mark on you by giving you his Holy Spirit. So if you've said yes to Christ, you've turned from your sin and repented and embraced Christ as your Lord and Savior, His Spirit now lives inside of you. And if you just have a steady conversation with Him through your days and weeks and months, He will give you peace that passes all understanding. And so when the storms come, you can be, you don't have to freak, you can be calm. Who would agree that when you're calm, when something's really hitting the fan, better results, right? When you're freaking out and emotions are going crazy like fireworks, nothing good comes out of it, right? And he knows that. And so he's telling us, if you'll just talk to me, I, you're in me. I'm here in you. We have a connection that they didn't have when they were just sitting next to me in the boat. Now your, his spirit lives in you and you are connected in a way that is supernatural. And he will supernaturally give you peace. Before the storm comes, get you ready for it. Now, here's my favorite part of this. My favorite miracle and my favorite part of it. And that is glory to God Almighty. Okay? This is where God shows off big time. This is where he receives the glory. The, the, the before it's for you. Peace, peace, peace. I pray for peace for all of you. That's good. Now he gets to show off. Now he gets to show up. Do me a favor. Go back to Genesis. Go with it. Seriously, in your Bible, pick up your Bible. If you don't have one, there's tons of Bibles all over the place. Just pick one up and take it. Open it, read it. If you don't have one, take it home with you. It's a gift, okay? You go right to the beginning of this amazing story of this amazing God. Okay? Nothing is in existence. It's complete nothingness. Nothing. There is, I wouldn't say that it's an empty universe because there's no universe. There's Literally, and I don't understand it, don't ask me to explain it, there's nothing. Complete void. And God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're just chilling and hanging out, doing their thing, right? Don't understand it, can't explain it, don't ask. But they're up there doing their God thing, right? And all of a sudden, what happens? Look at verse 3. Then God said. Verse 6. Then God said. Verse 9, then God said. Verse 14, then God said. Verse 20, then God said. Verse 24, then God said. Verse 28, God blessed them and said. Verse 29, then God said. There was nothing, but God said, and there was. Right? Again, don't ask me to explain it, because I can't explain how it happens. Okay? But God said, to the nothing, and there was something. I, I don't care how many degrees you have on the wall, you ain't figuring that one out. Okay? He said, and there was something. I love in, in the scriptures, it says over in uh, Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9, combine them together, it says that God merely spoke, he breathed it out of his mouth. There's light, 186,000 miles a second. There's planets, there's stars, there's gases, and there's, there's, there's mountains, and there's lakes, and clouds, and animals, and fish, and birds, and all this kind of stuff. There's nothing. He merely, I love, I love the choice of words, he merely spoke. Like, to us, it's like, <sighs> you guys want to do that? It's actually kind of fun. Anyone want to do that with me? Raise your hand. Come on. See, that's why I love God. On three. One, two, three. <laughs> you need to brush your teeth, bro. I'm just kidding. Okay? He merely, and to him it's like, I just said it. What do you guys think? It's a big deal. 
You guys can't do that. He's like, I merely spoke and I love that. He, he, it's so easy. He's like just chilling when he does this stuff. We're like trying to like organize my day. I got like three by five card. I got to do this, 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 this. And, you know, getting stamps and vacuuming here was like stressful for me. He's like, yeah, I'm just going to make some planets. <laughs> like he's just chilling, right? This is God. He's like, I merely spoke. I just breathed and out of my mouth come the heavens and the earth. Um, Psalm 29, go there for a second too. Psalm 29, it says that not only did he, he spoke into the very nothing and there was, but it also says in, in Psalm 29 that he actually is still doing that. He actually still speaks to his creation. Um, Psalm 29, verse 4, I'm just going to kind of jump down there real quick. The voice of the Lord echoes, that's present, right? Echoes above the sea, the voice, verse 4, the voice of the Lord is powerful, the voice of the Lord is majestic, verse 5, the voice of the Lord splits, that's what, present, splits the mighty cedars, um, verse 7, the voice of the Lord strikes with bolts of lightning, right, that's present, the voice of the Lord makes the barren wilderness quake, verse 9, the voice of the Lord twists mighty oaks, right? These are the things that are amazing, like I could do it, but to him, a mighty oak is like a toothpick in my hand. And his voice is so strong that he could break the toothpick, which is a mighty cedar, like this. He speaks, and it's lightning. We see lightning coming as we walk outside, and something crashes close, we're like, oh, heck no, I'm not going out there. And God's speaking it out of his mouth. This is the power of God. Job 38, he says, also, present tense, he says that he, in, 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 in Job chapter 38, he says that he shouts, that God shouts, that's speaking, he shouts at the clouds and it rains. It didn't say that he shouted at the clouds and, and created rain. No, he shouts, present, at the clouds and makes it rain. It also, in that same chapter, says that he causes the sunrise. He causes the new morning, and as we know now, that the earth spins. So in other words, what he's saying here is that God causes the earth to spin. He's the one who's causing it to spin. He didn't, he didn't start it spinning and then leave, and it's just spinning really fast. No, it says that he causes. That means he's still doing it. He's speaking to his creation. He's speaking to his creation. Now, now Psalm 65 gets a little more specific. It gets more specific and, and closely related to this story that we're sharing in Mark chapter 4. Psalm 65, 7, you don't have to go there, it says, You quieted the raging oceans with their pounding waves. Quieted, is that past, present, or future? It's past, right? So we did it then. Listen, Psalm 89, 9. You ruled the oceans. What's that? Present, right? That may have been past, but at least right now it's rule. It says you rule, that's present, right? You rule the oceans. That's one story. You subdue their storm-tossed waves. Let me read it again. You rule the oceans, you subdue their storm-tossed waves. Back to the text. So I was going to read it twice, right? As the evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die, we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the water, Silence, be still. Suddenly, the wind stopped. And there was a great calm. <clears throat> then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obeyed him. It's a legit question. Who is this guy? The Gospel of John says that the Word was with God and was God and put on flesh and dwelt among us. He's Emmanuel, God with us. It's a legit question and the answer is that Jesus is God. 
He's God. He is God. And it's just in this text, in, in, in Psalm 89, it says that you rule the oceans, you subdue the storm-tossed waves. And so what's happening here? It's the creator of heaven and earth still speaking to his creation. And that freaked these guys out. They had seen all the junior varsity stuff. This is the Super Bowl. This is not people. This is not multiplying fish. This is speaking to a lake and to a storm and saying, stop. And it stops. And these guys were all Jewish dudes, right? They, they knew, they were familiar with, with, with this God that, that subdued the oceans, that created all things. And all of a sudden, this guy that was with them was doing just that. He was speaking to the water and it was being subdued under his authority. That's who this guy was. Whose voice thunders across the emptiness and creates life? It's Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. John 1, 3 and 4. Everything was created through the Son. Speaking of Jesus. And he gave life to it all. Colossians 1.16, my favorite verse in all scripture. Everything was made by him and for him. Let me ask you a question. Why the sun sets in the cities? If they do nothing. If only to just so that when he wants to receive glory. Right? If only for us to, to, to set our eyes upon it and admire its beauty and give glory and credit to the one who painted it in the sky. You know what that is? Glory. You're giving him glory. Why is it that we have brass? I mean, and, 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 do you ever start with it? You, when I was up in Massachusetts, um, you know, brass down here, St. Augustine, not real comfy, cozy to lay on, you know what I mean? But you go up north, I was up north um, for my sister's wedding, and I shared some of the pictures with you guys a while back at the old place, and there was this 53-acre farm, and it's perfectly manicured. It's all that, like, um, Kentucky bluegrass, you know, really nice, soft, and, and you lay in it, you know what I'm saying? And it's soft, you're like, oh, man, this is so good. Did you ever do that? Just run your fingers through grass. Can you feel it almost? Right? Is it so that you don't feel so good? No, I'm not going to say You know what grass is good for? So cows can eat it, and we can eat them. <laughs> and we can give glory to God for an awesome steak. <laughs> Amen. Sorry. Right? But it's, it's this big 
thing, the spirit and Zeus looking thing up in the clouds. He's big and powerful. And sometimes we think about Jesus as this humble little servant who went to the cross. And yes, he is. But that humble little servant that went to the cross, he created the universe. That's the truth of God's word. That's the truth of God's word. So let me ask you this. Why, why were these disciples like, terrified? Why were they amazed? Why were they freaking out? They'd seen the leper healed. They'd seen the centurion's kid who was paralyzed and close to death healed. They saw all the demons cast out a simple command. They saw all the sick are healed no matter what their infirmity was. He healed them all. So why is it that they were freaking out? He asked them, why are you afraid? What? Don't, don't you know? I'm paralyzed with it. But he, you know what? These guys, like I said, they're all Jewish guys, right? Who's, the, who's like the, the Mac Daddy Jew of all time? Moses, right? Not me, Moses. Thank you, man. You know, Red Sea, burning bush. You know what I'm talking about? Moses, right? He'd seen it all. And he was the guy who, like, penned the first five books of the Bible. He was like the, the top dog Jew guy that all these guys knew of and they admired and loved and, and almost worshipped this dude, right? He'd been there and done that, this guy Moses. And so, listen to this. Over in Exodus 14, let me tell you why they freaked out. Not because he did it, but in Exodus 14, Moses is there before the Red Sea, right? He's there before the Red Sea. He's led them out of Egypt. All these people led them out of Egypt, and they've gone across the desert, and all of a sudden, boom, they're in front of the Red Sea. they got nowhere to go, right? And look, they look behind them, and, the, and, and Pharaoh and his chariots are coming to kill them. Impending death, right? It's coming, just like the disciples. We're going to drown. So when the Jewish people, you've seen the movie, we're going to die right here, right now. And what does Moses say? Moses doesn't say, hey, watch what I'm going to do. Moses stands up and he says, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you. And he does, right? Red Sea. But Moses says, watch what the Lord's going to do. But Jesus didn't say that. He's like, no, watch what I'm going to do. He's God. And that's why they were freaking out. You know what I'm saying? Like, you might say, well, that's what we did it with them. Let me ask you a question. If you, if you were carpooling for your job, and you, you know, and, and you had the same normal people that can't, they're carpooled every single day, and you get in the car, and he comes away, and he picks you up, and you get in the car, and you, and you sit down, and all of a sudden, you look over to your left, and there's like, God sitting over there, right? Like the lightning bolts coming across his face, and you know, like, just balancing some planets in his hand, you know, creating air and oxygen and water and stuff like you look over and you're like, ah! what's going on? You keep freaking out, right? Well, they're, they're freaking out because they didn't realize that they were sitting in the boat with Almighty God. Like, you'd be freaking out too, right? Don't leave me hanging up here. I'd be freaking out. I have to change my depends, right? I'd be freaking out. This guy is God sitting right next to these guys. So they were freaking out. It's not that they were, like, scared bad. They were scared, like, it's God next to me. Who is this guy? It's God. They realize that the, when the one who speaks to creation and it listens and it obeys, that's only God could do this. Only God could do this. Creation was subject to the creator and it was apparent right here in this little boat in the middle of this little lake. And they were sitting front seat to the creator speaking to its creation. And that's why they were freaking out. All of creation is subject to the Creator's voice. We see this in John chapter 10, verse 3, 4, and 27, where it talks about this, that the sheep, Jesus says, the sheep know my voice, and they follow me. Remember that section of Scripture? They know my voice, and they follow me, because we know His voice. We know the voice of our Creator. And it's Jesus Christ, the Lord. They were sitting next to God, and they were freaking out. That's why they were so freaked out. You know, the centurion, he, he got it. Remember what he said? He says, when the authority says, jump, I say, how about he says, He says, come, and I come. Go, and I go. I tell my slave to do this, and they say, I do it. All of creation is subject to the voice of its creator. So listen, when the brother starts telling the water to stop and it does, it's going to freak you out, right? If you're in the boat and all of a sudden some dude 
stands up at a storm and says, silence, be still. And this horrific storm that's threatening your life just goes glass. You'd be freaking out too, right? Who wouldn't be? Everyone would be. And they would totally freak out. So if you still haven't chosen who your God is, let me tell you this. No one, you can Google it all you want. No one has ever, ever claimed deity and done that. Except Jesus Christ the Lord. He's a great choice. Anyone who could do that, that's my God. I want him on my side. You ever be in the playground, you pick the teens? Oh, okay. him. Right? That's where we should be with, with Jesus. Oh, you, 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 you can talk to the lake and make it stop. I want you. I want you. Believe in me because of the works that I do. If you're a Christian, but you feel as though that there's waves crashing in your boat, right? Now it's getting worse. You have waves crashing into your boat. Quit talking in absolutes. Stop saying, I'm going to die. Stop saying, I'm going down. That's not Jesus' talk. That's, honestly, that's loser talk. You're not a loser. You have the one living in you that spoke to the lake and it stopped. And I don't know if you all realize that. So I'll say it again, that the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead lives inside of you. And if you will have a steady conversation with him, his promise, the one who calmed the lake, that guy's promise said, I will give you peace. So when the storm hits, it's beyond anything we can explain or understand. But for those of us that make a practice as my wife does, they make a practice of just steady dialogue with her creator. So when we have no money, she doesn't panic. I do. It's not funny, though. It's sad. I know better. How many times do I have to read this before I actually apply it to my wife? But then I could ask you all the same question, right? How many times are you going to read it before you apply it to your wife? His promise is beyond anything you have to say or do. It doesn't mean you can't earn it. He says, if you will do this, I'll, I will do this. And so I would just say, do it. Just do it. Colossians 3.16, I'm just going to end with this verse. And that is this. Colossians 3.16. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your life. And so my prayer for you tonight is that this story in all of its richness would permeate your heart today. And that you would begin to understand the scope and the magnitude and the power of this one Jesus Christ who lives inside of you. And if you will ask him to help, if you will simply have a constant conversation and tell him what you need, and thank him for what he's done already, the peace that surpasses all understanding will be delivered to your front door. Amen? Amen. I'm going to take communion now. So the gentleman can come up and get communion. And I've asked you to hold on to it. I'm going to take communion together. Thank you.